My name is Mary Bonato. I am an attorney at Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders, where I am the Civil Rights Project Director. Courts are vital to our overall system because if courts are, courts are there to say when a legislature has crossed the wrong line, crossed the constitutional line, courts are there to make sure that those principles of equality and liberty are fulfilled for everyone because there are no exceptions of any sort in our Constitution. And that means when it comes to who is on the courts, we obviously need people who care passionately about the Constitution, who understand that in the 18th century, 19th, you know, in the 18th, excuse me, that in the 18th century, uh, the framers of our Constitution were not setting forth a rule book. They were setting forth enduring principles that would guide our country um, for centuries more. And so it's essential that courts and judges bring to that task of judging um, a real sense, a modern sense of what does liberty, what does equality mean in present times. There's Justice Ginsburg in the Virginia Military Institute case talked about how the history of our Constitution is the story of including those who once had been ignored and forgotten and excluded into that circle of citizenship. And I feel like that is happening with LGBT people now. It's still very much a work in progress. But that continues because those who would discriminate, those who harbor prejudices and attitudes uh, that would, you know, result in unfair treatment, they mutate. You know, they understand that a court may set a rule, a, you know, policy, a law may come into effect. And consciously or unconsciously, people continue to try to act on their own personal beliefs. And so I think when we think about the courts, we have to think about them holistically also in terms of a larger movement where we have to engage with people's attitudes uh, in all branches of government so that in the end, no matter what the issue, people believe discrimination is wrong, that Americans remain committed to equal opportunity and not just equal treatment. You know, it's really interesting that when you look at, for example, the Romer decision from 96, the Lawrence decision from 2003, and then what the Supreme Court did in 2013 in Windsor and Hollingsworth, even though Hollingsworth didn't get to the merits, you know, what you really see is that the court is saying, when there's something important that's generally available to everyone, we're not going to tolerate double standards that are imposed only on gay people. So in Romer, anyone could seek non-discrimination protections, but they were walled off by Amendment 2 in Colorado. Not permissible. We cannot have second-class citizens in our country. Likewise, in Lawrence, everyone enjoys an equal liberty, you know, to sexual intimacy and privacy in their own homes. So where do sodomy laws fit into that, that are singling out, really meant to single out gay people's sexuality? Court would have none of that. Liberty belongs to all of us. Then you take Windsor. You know, in Windsor, what, what everyone came to understand is that in our nation, the federal government doesn't say who can marry whom, and in fact has always respected state determinations of marital status. But in 1996, in a panic about Hawaii, and that same-sex couples might marry, and a, a zeal to defend traditional morality, uh, as, as the Congress then stated, a new rule was imposed so that the federal government would not respect marriages of same-sex couples, even though they didn't exist for another eight years. Again, another double standard. And for those reasons, I'm actually, um, I'm actually Please, that the court continues to understand that double standards and attempts to disadvantage gay people simply because of who they are is not even rational lawmaking. It's not legitimate. And so that, I think, is a very important message that in our government, we all come to our government as equals, and the idea that you're trying to put a thumb on the scale and just disadvantage people because of who they are is not acceptable. Now, having said that, I also think it would be enormously helpful around the nation to instruct local and state lawmakers about where the permissible boundaries are in using someone's sexual orientation or gender identity in lawmaking. And in my view, not surprisingly, it should be walled off. Like, when is it ever relevant that somebody's sexual orientation or gender identity should make a difference in terms of the rights and obligations that they have to the government or should receive from the government? Having said that, the court has not yet had the need to go there. Although, again, I think all of us continue to press, quite rightly, that it is the court's job to announce what the standard should be. And I certainly hope that as we get back to the Supreme Court, perhaps, 
in this next round, which I think will be on marriage itself, that we, we, will, we will get there. As some circuit courts have now been getting there, some federal district courts, and as several state Supreme Courts already have done as well.